Hello and welcome to Lighting with Practicals. Uh, my name is Professor Walsh and I will be your uh, host for this presentation. Uh, this was done for the Savannah College of Art and Design uh, based on a query from their administration on uh, the topic of using practicals in uh, filming situations. So as as always, if any of you are curious about my credentials or um, the basis for my points of view or my opinions on motion picture techniques, technology, uh, and so forth, you are obviously free to access my IMDB uh, work experience uh, and check out my body of work. Um, I'm currently uh, an instructor. Uh, I work as uh, an adjunct uh, with the University of Central Florida, and uh, I possess an MFA in creative writing and a bachelor's in uh, writing and rhetoric uh, English studies. Uh, I have 30 years of experience in motion pictures on features and television uh, broadcasting, uh, as well as music videos and commercials. Um, in this presentation, I want to talk to you a little bit about natural lighting, uh, our perception of natural lighting. Uh, I have a very nice video for you uh, by Ben Davis, uh, BSC, who's going to talk to you a little bit about his interpretation of natural lighting. Um, I want to impress upon you the idea that before you add light to anything, you should look at what you have uh, available and make an assessment of what's available and decide whether or not you actually need to add anything. What are you starting with? In other words, look before you light. Uh, I'm going to uh, just do a little bit of review with you folks. Um, this conversation obviously is happening um, on the heels of a three-point lighting demonstration that you've already had uh, probably uh, this semester with me if you're studying under, under me in the film department or you may have seen my uh, three-point lighting videos uh, online on YouTube, for instance. Uh, I'll talk briefly about the responsibilities of the key light, uh, the fill light, and the edge or backlight. How do we use them? What are they really for? Um, and then I want to talk to you about a concept that doesn't come up in conversation a lot, and that's negative fill. Um, it's a very interesting concept. I think it's relevant in the age of digital cameras, and I just want to introduce you to that uh, topic and uh, see how you feel about it. Um, I, I have a brief video on window light and how I approach the concept of window light uh, for shooting at practical locations. Um, and then I have uh, a couple of interesting discussions and some demo about uh, lighting with lamps using practicals in the shot, uh, how to rig a practical, um, and what types of solutions we have for controlling the output of pre-existing fixtures in a practical location or in a set that has been art directed, for instance, by a set designer. Um, in those cases, uh, we have a lot of control over the fixtures that we're using. Even if they are pre-existing fixtures uh, and all we're doing is changing bulbs, we, we do want to exercise our craft and demonstrate control over these practicals so that we get the best possible exposure results from those fixtures. And so I have a little bit of material on that for you as well. So as you folks may be aware, uh, especially if you've had classes with me before, uh, I like to use videos from Cook Optics Television. Um, I have been in contact uh, with them. Uh, and I have uh, discussed using their videos in my presentations and in my lectures, and they have agreed very graciously to allow me uh, to share their materials with you folks in class. So uh, Cook Optics is a lens manufacturer in the United Kingdom. They've been in business for a very long time. Uh, they produce uh, a few uh, very wonderful series of lenses under the Cook Optics banner. Um, particularly um, the i-series uh, Cinema Primes, uh, the uh, S4 Mini Primes, uh, and then they have uh, a few um, new models out uh, just this year uh, that are reminiscent of some of their old um, Pancro cinematic prime lenses and so forth. Uh, their products are wonderful. Uh, they have spherical and anamorphic products. And um, they put out a lot of videos, and it's usually discussions by ASC, BSC cinematographers 
uh, and others discussing craft work uh, on a variety of topics from lensing and lighting, codecs and camera work of, of all, of all uh, shapes and form. This particular video is from Ben Davis and he uh, is a cinematographer. You may recognize his name for a film that uh, received critical recognition uh, a year or two ago, um, Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Um, so this is a really uh, wonderful conversation that Ben is going to have. It's about six minutes long, so sit back and enjoy the content, and I'll follow up after the video's conclusion. I think when you're working on location, you're very much with a full-on location with a short schedule. You're far better off going for something that's very natural and going into place and seeing, well, what, what's it giving me? How do I then take what this location has and enhance that? How do I take where the light's coming from? How do I then take that and say all right well this is the light source how do i embrace that maybe i need to put some negative here maybe put a bit more light through that window how do i embrace what the location is giving me you have to be at the right time of day and then you have to bend and shape things into being something beautiful you know that may involve negative fill that may involve embracing a fill light may involve going in and saying oh, i want all those windows taken out or blinds put in those windows because i want to light it with this one practical there's a scene that happens in three bubbles where they find out about francis putting up the billboards and woody harrison and abby cornish have a scene up at the stable and we play it in silhouette but with just a tiniest bit of light. I mean, and now, there was much more fill light coming in from that side. But we went up there and I saw it, it was at dusk, and I thought this scene needs to play in a silhouette. But what I had to do was take off all the light that was coming from the other end of the stables. So we just put up a large black behind camera and a couple around it and just played it like that. And that's just taking what's there and shaping it into something else. So, I mean, that's a very simple example of that sort of approach. So if I look back at my work and I'd say, is there anything I'd do differently? I'd say, through your career, you tend to use less lights. There are really good DPs in there, like Barry Atkoy, Chris Bakers. Their work looks very natural, but it has a great beauty to it. And that doesn't happen by accident. You don't go in somewhere and go, oh, look, it just looks amazing. I put the camera here. Everywhere I put the camera, it looks incredible. You may get... One shot in ten, you'll go in there. It was still the top You know, everywhere you go, you're not going to photograph an amazing image. You have to find that image. You know, in cinematography, you're doing five scenes a day. You're not, it's not going to happen. So you have to take something that's natural and you have to build it into something that does that. You know, and that takes work. If you're shooting on location, for instance, you're walking to a place and saying, well, where is the light coming from? Where should it be coming from? And how do you embrace that? So say you're in a normal interior environment, you've got light coming in through the windows, but you put your camera, the window's really hot and the interior is really dark. So you've got to try and, you want to keep that aesthetic going, but you've got to try and join the two together. So you've still got to want the windows hot, but you, you haven't got enough light inside. So, you, so what you might do is outside the windows, you might find somewhere to put a large bounce and try and push a little bit more light through the windows, but not affecting what you're seeing through out of them or you might try and fill inside the room you know i so i think a lot of it is about that they're getting the balance right the long take starts as a day exterior we had to do quite large iris corrections during the shot you know what you're trying to do is to try and get the darker elements, like when he goes up the stairs, you know, how do you get light into that area, which is very dark. Naturally, when you're following him up and then leading him out, so you're looking in every direction. So we had a couple of lights rigged up in there just to put a little more light in the stairs. That was far more of a technical exercise with the camera movement than it was with lighting. You know, there may have been three lights used in the entirety of that shot, if that. And it was just embracing what was there. There was some negative inside the office where he punches red Welby and throws him out the window. There was some negative in there just to get the contrast better. But that was kind of it. That was just Martin and I working out the idea behind the shot. You know, we were always convinced it should be a one-shot scene, that. Um, felt it had to be. And then it was just working out the technicality of it and how we might do it. But it was 
to be honest, it's pretty straightforward. You know, doing one shot stuff is not that complex. I just feel there has to be a reason behind it. You know, you have to remember when you do things in one shot, you don't editorially, you don't have anywhere to go. I've seen a lot of one shot stuff, and you you think, well, why? Because sometimes I see one shot stuff, and I think, well, why? You know, it feels to be a technical exercise, and what you're trying to do is go, hey, look at this, it's one shot. I think there always has to be a reason why you're trying to do that. I do think there's something great about one shot stuff. Uh, I think, you know, examples like Birdman, you know, I mean, Birdman's amazing because it works in an immersive way, I think, one shot stuff. But that has been embraced for the entire film, and that really works. But I've seen other films where they do a one shot thing, and you just think, well, you just made your life technically very difficult for no real reason because it's not working as a one shot. Because it's a very intense scene and it and things happen in there which surprise you. What you don't want to do sometimes a cut to something can telegraph a moment to the audience. Like you cut round there, oh something's gonna happen because we've cut round this side. So I wanted the things, you know, when he punches red <laughs> That comes as a shock. So if you just suddenly cut round to the other side and his fist comes back, I thought you would have known it. Also, I think that what happens with a cut sometimes is it gives the audience a moment to to inhale, to let out a breath. And sometimes in those very intense scenes, it's like the shot starts, the breath is taken, and then you're sort of holding that breath through the shot. And the cut can be a reason to go... To, you know, and sometimes it lets them off the hook a little. So that's what I like about one shot things that are incredibly immersive in a way for an audience. Okay, so that's Mr. Ben Davis, and I think um, I know that he gets off a little bit on a side topic of uh, the one shot or the long shot, the extended take. Uh, however you want to refer to that. Um, but what I have found in my experience is that oftentimes those long take shots, those uh, long steady cam walks, for instance, or those long handheld sequences, um, you're going to pass through a lot of set. You're going to walk through a lot of environments, and it's really hard to hide lighting setups using conventional fixtures um, because it limits where the camera can actually turn and look. If if the operator needs to pivot to accommodate a move that has been um, uh, uh, taken by an actor uh, uh, out of spontaneity, uh, and you turn and you suddenly see, you know, a 5K built in with what we call the old number seven, uh, you know, a, a six by or an eight by diffusion set with siders and toppers and bottomers and gel frames, uh, you know, that can't happen. So. Uh, a lot of times what we have to do when we have these long takes is we have to um, use the available fixtures and, and enhance them in any way that we can in order to um, photographically to get the results that we need, um, you know, in terms of exposure and color accuracy and so forth. And then sometimes uh, the grittiness of the real uh, fixtures um, is going to make a lot of sense uh, in the final uh, rendered image. And so to have it too beautifully lit, for lack of a better word, might be uh, technically an error uh, in terms of remaining true to the material. Now, in a shot where a guy's walking through the police station and across the street and then up the stairs uh, into the real estate office and he's going to uh, knock the tar out of somebody in the upstairs office, I mean, um, I don't know that beautiful lighting in there is really going to make a whole lot of difference. In fact, it might actually take us out of that moment instead of uh, allowing us to immerse ourselves in the action um, and become, you know, um, in, in many ways a participant in what's going on. Um, so here's what um, I want to put some thoughts into your mind. Here's what's next. Um, I want to talk to you about qualifying the situation that you're about to shoot in. So what am I, what am I talking about? We're talking about looking at natural lighting, looking at what's available. And I consider lighting from fixtures 
in interiors to also be natural lighting in the sense that it is the lighting that would typically be in that space. So if you walk into a bank, for instance, or if you walk into a department store and they're using, if they're using the big gaudy um, industrial fluorescent tubes, okay, that might be the reality of that space and to light it in any other way might be obvious and it might be unrealistic uh, unless we're going for some sort of um, hyper real or some sort of surreal rendering um, as in a, a, a dream or in a, um, uh, in a hallucination, then yeah, altering the lighting to something other than what would normally be there might make sense. But if you're trying to make an accurate rendering of somebody shopping in a department store, for instance, or shopping in a grocery store, are you going to want to change the lighting from what it would normally be to something that might end up looking prettier and more quote unquote Hollywood? Probably not. It, it might be to the extent that all you really need to do is change out some bulbs for photographically corrected phosphors in, for, in terms of fluorescence, for instance. Get rid of the green eco-watt spiky uh, cheap bulbs that they put in, a, in an 8-foot or a 4-foot uh, commercial fluorescent fixture and put in some really nice color-corrected visions and color tubes, for instance. Uh, and then you can pick from uh, incandescent balance 3200 or daylight balance 5600, and your uh, house fixtures are then going to match color color wise uh, the color balance properties that you've dialed into your digital camera or the color balance of your film stock. Okay, so I want you to qualify your lighting conditions. Go go into a location and first ask yourself some very pointed questions: Is it indoors or outdoors? What do I want to do about it if it's either of those scenarios? Because I have different approaches in either in either situation. Is it day or night? Okay, because that's going to make a lot of difference too, possibly in your color balance or the way you're going to render colors uh, in post production. Do you like what's happening there naturally? In other words, is the normal lighting scenario in that room uh, sufficient in terms of shape, uh, texture? color and contrast to what you might want to achieve on your own. In other words, if you had to build that in a set on a soundstage, four black walls, a black ceiling, and a black floor, and you recreated a scene in a department store, would you light it the same way? Or would you have a different approach? So pay attention to color, contrast, intensity, texture, and then ultimately tone. Um, so if you can't use the lighting in a location, if you decide that it's not qualified for some reason, and whatever that reason is, it's subjective, it's up to you, but you've determined that the existing lighting is no good, can you change it? And if you change it, what, what are you going to change it to? Uh, can you enhance what's already there? In other words, if I have... Uh, uh, I'm going to show you some sequences from a movie Take in a minute where we shot uh, in a correctional facility. Uh, it's lit by fluorescent tubes. It's what's normally there. Uh, it has a really uh, clinical industrial look to it, which matches the themes of, uh, of being in jail. Uh, but the color was horrible because it was all eco-watt uh, four-foot fluorescent tubing that, you know, you can buy at Home Depot for about four dollars a piece and instead we loaded up all of the lighting in the jail with um, uh, visions and color uh, photographically color corrected tubes uh, which are about twenty five dollars a piece and look beautiful on camera and then you can always dirty up the color in post but if you start with dirty color that's all you're ever gonna have so what we want to do is make color accurate decisions on set and then dirty it up in post where we have complete control in a non-destructive environment. Okay, so moving on. Oh, and ultimately I want to make sure that whatever we do serves the story. So if you're going to make a change, it should always be for the better and it should always be in service of the script and the story and the performance is taking place. Okay, and our lighting shouldn't really call attention to itself. I think that's an important point to make. So here's a clip from the film Take. Okay, and this is just a few minutes long, um, and I'll just set it up for you, and then I want you to understand what I meant about shooting in the Chico Color Correction, uh, uh, Correctional Facility uh, in uh, Northridge, California. Um, so, Mini Driver plays the mother of a young child who was kidnapped and who subsequently died uh, uh, while he was uh, being held hostage by 
another man, a despot uh, played by Jeremy Renner, uh, who is a, a down and out kind of a guy with a gambling problem and uh, his life's just not working out. His personal life is a mess. His uh, professional life as a um, as a, uh, a repo man is, is also not um, panning out well for him. Uh, and in desperation to pay some of his gambling debts, he tries to rob a grocery store. And when he does, uh, in order to get away uh, from the situation that he's created, uh, he shoots the uh, one of the um, uh, one of the clerks at the uh, at the supermarket, and he ends up having to kidnap this woman's child uh, in order to make a clean getaway. And in the process of getting away, he crashes his car, and the little boy dies. So uh, in this scene, Jeremy Renner has been. Um, he has been captured by the police. He has uh, been uh, gone to trial. He's been sentenced uh, for execution. And this is the confrontation between Mini Driver and uh, Jeremy Renner uh, towards the end of the movie. Now, like I said, we were shooting in an actual corrections facility. So it's not like you can go in there and do a lot of extensive lighting and a lot of rigging and, and building of lighting schemes and devices in a functioning public facility like this. Uh, you got to walk in and whatever you're going to do has to happen uh, fairly efficiently. You have to expedite it fairly quickly. Uh, and it has to be something that you can bring in and build and bring out with you at the end of every shooting day because they, you know, life in a, in a jail goes on 24 seven. So, um, what we did is we went in on a, on a tech scout and we took a look at the facility and we decided what the, the best approach would be. Now, the director had uh, certain pre-qualifications for everything that we shot. Uh, everything that we shot that had Jeremy Renner in it was going to have a cyan tone to it. And that was predominantly going to be done in post, but we did a, a, a certain amount of it in camera as well. I ordered Cal Color Cyan gels from Roscoe um, to add to some of the lights and things to start introducing the cyan qualities to the image so that uh, the colorist could then finish the cyan saturation in post-production. And then everything that we did that was mini driver uh, was tended to be warmer tobacco -y colored and that was also done with gels and with post-production coloration. And this particular confrontation, since it's in the prison and it's Jeremy Renner's moment of um, uh, of redemption, uh, we went with the cyan bias here. Uh, although ordinarily, when we when we see Minnie Driver, we would see her under different toning, color toning. Uh, so she is confronting Jeremy, and it's her moment to forgive him, and it's his moment to ask for and receive forgiveness. And it's a pretty powerful scene. And the reason we kept the fluorescence and the overheads the way uh, I've described it to you is because. If you've ever really been in a in a supermarket or in a bank or in a place where they're using a lot of the overhead fluorescent lighting, some some classrooms and school public schools, um, it's really a harsh kind of unflattering light, and it can create it can create a lot of shadows and texturing to the human face that's that's really pretty harsh, and 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 um, certainly. It certainly does not do any justice to the subjects that you're photographing under that kind of light. Except in this situation, it seemed to make a lot of sense, okay? We're going to be looking at a guy who has been sentenced to execution for doing some really bad stuff, and he's been stressed out about it, and he doesn't feel good about himself, and he knows he's going to die. And in those situations, you don't want to beauty that guy up with some lighting that's going to make him look like anything but what he his character represents, which is a desperate man who, uh, at the very least, seeks uh, uh, redemption and, and salvation in his moment um, of uh, departing the world. And, and Minnie Driver is the person who is so pent up with anger and resentment uh, in her moment, she really has to reach within herself and find the strength and, and inner um, and, and inner uh, um, emotional uh, fortitude to forgive this man in spite of the, the thing that he's done to her. And, and she has to be able to move on with her life and he has to be able to, uh, you know, move on to whatever it is that he's going to move on to in the great hereafter. But take a look at this scene and let me know what you think. And, and, and we should discuss uh, at some point whether you feel 
uh, the choices were appropriate and whether they match the situation. I think they do, but you, you be the judge and let me know uh, how you feel in the, in the comment section. Bobby stand right here. I need to search your purse. Feet shoulder width apart, hands against the wall. Ready, ma'am? Yes. I'm so sorry. Try to imagine who you are. What your day was like before. I've put together your entire life. Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, you may have noticed that one of the security guards uh, in the opening scene has a little bit of light on his face. Uh, I did add a supplementary tube on the floor around the corner uh, hidden from camera uh, just to give that guy a little bit of shape. I let the girl in the foreground go to silhouette um, because people of color are um, going to require more uh, exposure uh, in, in the majority of situations. I had a white hallway and I had no, we saw the whole hallway, I had nowhere to hide a light for her in the first place. So I had to make a pragmatic decision, which was to let her be sort of silhouette um, which is kind of interesting, too, because you don't necessarily need to know the details of the lives of the, of the correctional officers. And so by being a silhouette, it's almost like she could be any, any person in that situation who was uh, you know, responsible for um, you know, supervising this man and his execution. Uh, I did put a little bit of light on the one face of the guy around the corner, um, just to give the, the shot a little bit of depth. Um, and then the other security guard, I kind of let him get whatever was coming from across the hall and around the corner from that tube. Um, and so it was kind of a variation. The three people got uh, varying degrees of, um, of supplementary lighting in that shot. Um, in inside the room itself, over the uh, table was a four foot four bank industrial fluorescent uh, fixture. Uh, I changed out the tubes from eco watts to visions and color. Um, I used daylight tubes because I knew that there was going to be a cyan bias added in post anyway, so I wanted to keep the spectrum on the cool side. Uh, added a little bit of cyan gel uh, to the light, and then I added what we call a teaser, which uh, is just about a 12 to 14 inch um, um, uh, bit of fabric all around the uh, perimeter of the light and just taped it to the ceiling uh, and that kind of helped control the spill uh, coming from the light uh, and kept the walls from getting too bright and, and you can sort of see there's some odd scalloping on the wall uh, in the background 
where the skirting was a little uneven from side to side and so forth. But basically what it's designed to do is sort of snoot the output of that four foot four bank fixture in the ceiling and keep the projected light uh, in a downward direction and, and not spreading out uh, towards the walls and everything. As a result of that, there was a brighter exposure at the table than there was, say, in the doorway. And when Minnie came in during the rehearsals, um, I kind of showed everybody what was going on with the lighting, but Minnie was insistent that she didn't want to approach the table because she didn't feel like she would be comfortable confronting that man in, in that close proximity. She felt like her character in all of her vulnerability and all of her defensiveness would just barely be able to muster the strength to enter that room at all, let alone walk up to the table and talk to him in any way. Um, and so she hung back in the doorway of the room and by doing that she was really only getting indirect light from whatever was coming out of that fixture projecting down and bouncing off the table and the resulting white walls and gathering on her face which is why you really see the grain in that image and we shot film on this so that's the reason why it's not it's not digital noise that's actual film grain so uh, she was in quite a bit of shadow she was about a stop stop and a half below the exposure on Jeremy Renner uh, and ultimately, I think it worked for her because it softened up her lighting a bit as well uh, and gave her a bit more of a neutral appearance. In other words, I didn't want too much shadowing on her face one way or the other because the interpretation of her character in that moment was devoid of all feeling. She was spent emotionally uh, and spiritually. She was just spent. And so really, her visage needed to be neutral in all aspects, in tone and in, and in shape and texture and shadows and everything. And on the other hand, Jeremy's sitting right under that fluorescent fixture, and I let that light just beat him up in terms of the bags under his eyes. He had a, um, he had a milky prosthetic over his left eye where in part of the film he gets beat up really bad and, and he's blind in his left eye. So he's got that prosthetic going on and then he's got the bags under his eyes and he's got a black eye and, and he has really, he's spent also, he's been, you know, put through the, uh, the crucible and he's just, he's just ready to get on with it, whatever it is, whether it's his execution or, or not. He's just ready to be done with it. He's exhausted and completely out of energy. And so I think he really looked good that way. And there was nothing I would have been able to do in that situation, I think, that would have been any more suitable to exactly what we had. So I let it be that. I just took control of the fixture itself and made sure that I teased out the, uh, you know, the spill and kept it off the walls, added my cyan color, which is what ch uh, uh, director Charles Oliver wanted, and, um, and then changed out the tubes to something that was more uh, applicable to the film stock, which was the daylight visions and color four foot tubes. Um, and so I, f I, I picked the final freeze frame uh, to end this clip because in this shot, uh, Jeremy's actually uh, looking out the window of his interview room. So he is uh, going through his pre-execution interview with um, with a, um, a a neutral um, sectarian uh, counselor, and they're talking about salvation, and they're talking about life after death, and they're talking about um, you know he's reconciling his life with a um, with a uh, a counselor, and at one point Jeremy walks to the window to look outside and make a comment about where he's been and what how his life has ended up the way it has and the shot is from the outside of the jail looking in through the window with the bars uh, at Jeremy's character as he you know sort of opens up his emotional uh, feelings and, and delivers his dialogue um, and I chose this freeze frame uh, particularly because I want you to know that this is artificial lighting so in other words, this shot was done on a soundstage um, and uh, it was so, sort of a shot that was added to the schedule, so it was a surprise. Um, uh, but part of these lesson plans that we have is learning how to walk into a situation and solve the problem with your experience and with your um, with your mind's eye and your imagination. So. 
I, I imagine that, you know, if this guy's going to be executed at midnight, that the lighting was probably going to be late afternoon, which is not necessarily um, bright and contrasty, especially if it was maybe a dreary day, you know, which would totally suit the script if it was overcast and maybe drizzly a little bit. Um, and this guy was going to be executed, so it would totally fit the mood. So on a day like that, the lighting is really kind of indirect and fairly soft coming from above. So I just placed a giant um, a styrofoam bounce board over the window itself, so, uh, supported it on either end with a few stands. And then I pounded a couple of 2000 watt open face uh, fixtures called blondes up into the bounce board and directed the bounce at the wall and into the window. Um, and so in essence, what I did is I emulated skylight, uh, indirectly because it was a bounce. And then I don't think, um, I might've had some diffusion gel on the fixtures themselves, um, in an effort to control, uh, the harshness of it and the intensity of it. Um, so there was probably some 250 or, uh, Lee 216 on the 2K lights themselves. And then they were bouncing into the bounce board and down onto the exterior set and through the window. And that's what the, the, that's the light that's on Jeremy's face in that window. That's all he's got. Uh, and then there's a little bit of illumination in the background just so we can sort of see that there's a space behind him. It's not a black void. Uh, and that's it. So, and I think, you know, for a couple of moments on screen, uh, I think it worked pretty well. Uh, and really all it was was a, uh, a one wall, two flat set that was uh, kind of in the back corner of uh, the stage we were shooting on. And, uh, you know, we went in and we whipped this shot off fairly quickly. And then uh, most of the magic in terms of color, saturation and, and contrast uh, was done to this in post in DaVinci Resolve. So that's, uh, you know, that's an example of thinking on your feet and understanding what the quality of a light source is going to look like and then being able to emulate it with the tools that you have available, okay?